Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Molly's Salon. This is our weekly program every Thursday where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. And we've been living through a critical time in American history with the COVID-19 pandemic, which Arena Stage has now been turned into a vaccination site in Washington, D.C. And we're vaccinating anywhere from 500 to 700 people a day. So that's been very, very exciting. And of course, the vital social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter. And two days ago, the verdict came down as guilty uh, for Chauvin for his murder of George uh, Floyd. And just an important and critical turning point in the United States uh, for Black lives and for our police and the relationship in Black communities. Um, it's uh, so impactful, I think, for all of us and an important uh, time for us to examine what's happening in this country and uh, to be brave enough to speak out about it. Our guests are a variety of artists and leaders discussing brand new ideas, how they're coping with the coronavirus and making positive social change, as well as showing us those beautiful glimmers of hope for the future, which we all need. My guests this week are Ken Ludwig, a award-winning playwright, including recently Dear Jack, Dear Louise, and Jeannie Sakata, actress and playwright at Arena Stage with Hold These Truths. Now here's the interesting piece, is uh, Ken's play Dear Jack, Dear Louise, and Jeannie's play Hold These Truths all take place during World War II. And this next year, uh, Sima Soweko, will be uh, directing uh, both of them in Virginia, at Virginia stage. And um, they'll be running concurrently with each other. So exciting to have both of them on the program this evening. Ken Ludwig is a Tony and Olivier award-winning playwright. He's written 28 plays and musicals, including six shows on Broadway and seven in London's West End. His work has been performed in either 30 countries and more than 20 languages. And uh, his best known works include Lend Me a Tenor and Crazy for You. He has other Broadway plays that have starred Alec Baldwin, Carol Burnett, Tony Shalhoub. Uh, his latest book entitled How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare was named Best Shakespeare Book of the Year. Dear Jack, Dear Louise won the 2020 Helen Hayes MacArthur Award for Best New Play. And he lives here in Washington, DC. And aren't we happy? His plays are performed somewhere in the United States every single night of the year. Okay, let that penny drop. Ken, it's so great to see you and uh, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Molly. And you know how much I'm devoted to Arena, so I'm very honored. Well, we certainly have produced a number of your plays, Ken. Yeah. Um, we, we really have. And uh, the most recent has been Dear Jack, Dear Louise. And, you know, I think one of the things that was exciting about the play, first of all, it had a super premiere at the theater, but also pivoting during the pandemic to recreate the story through physical mailed letters. And it's a story for those in the audience that don't know, that is about the courtship of your parents. And when you're writing a play like this, Ken, how did you navigate writing about people that you have a personal relationship with? And I have one other question that maybe you can weave in within that, which is, did writing the show influence or impact the view you have of your parents? Great question. Um, uh, writing it was a, a joy. Uh, my mother, for those who don't know the play or haven't seen it, it is, was a young woman growing up in Brooklyn, New York, who wanted to be a showgirl. And she went to one of those boarding houses in New York out of Kaufman and Ferber and, 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 and did that. My father was in the army and was a, a brand new doctor and he was drafted and this was during World War II and they were 3000 miles apart. Uh, be, and they had never met. Their fathers set them up on a date by mail. So they start writing to each other. And I thought as I've gotten older, gee, it would be fun to write about 
something to do with my family. And I thought about that and I thought, well, maybe my mother visiting the army base, but she never did. She could never get a flight out during the war and they never met till the end. So I thought, well, let me tell that story honestly. And so I, and then instead of a wacky Lucille Ball kind of character going to an army base in Medford, Oregon, it ended up being a story told entirely in letters. Uh, and it's the two of them and they move around the stage, but they tell the story in letters and, uh, and it did influence uh, me in thinking about my parents. I know they wrote these letters, but my mother decided to get rid of them before she died because she felt they must have been intimate in a way that it would have made her feel uncomfortable knowing her boys, I have a brother, uh, would see them. And, and so she, I never had them, but I knew they existed. So I created this uh, exchange of letters over uh, several years time uh, when they didn't know each other. And uh, it's a romance and he, go, and he goes to Europe and it's very uh, uh, frightening. So when I think about what, what changed what I thought about them was thinking about a fellow uh, like me who suddenly is drafted and it's wartime and you're sent overseas and you're told you go to boot camp and you learn how to fire rifles and for he grew up in a little town of Coatesville, Pennsylvania. So they both grew up tremendously during the war. That's so great, Ken. Uh, I don't know if I ever told you, but my sister unearthed letters from my mother and my father in a little box, which mm -hmm. we have both read. And there's probably 30 of them because it was during World War II as well. And I have to say, a number of them are quite seamy. Wow. And uh, so that made me rethink part of the relationship between my mom and my dad, um, which was uh, pretty fascinating. So we both had fathers uh, that fought during World War II. Right. And we're in this moment, Ken, of incredible turmoil in this country. And what's just happening now at the level of a number of legislator, legislatures are, are laws that are coming out that are saying that uh, people don't have the right to protest hmm. or people have the right to be able to uh, drive a car into protesters and not be convicted. So what does that do to you internally as a writer, as a lawyer, as uh, someone who is um, very American? Well, it makes me angry and it makes me want to write more and it makes me want to write about these issues. You know, when I went to law school, you learn in the first few days about the constitution, you take constitutional law and there's something called freedom of, of speech uh, that uh, has evolved and evolved and uh, it's part of, who we are and who we are as a nation. And uh, it's why we're so proud to be Americans. And the notion of that right being taken away from us just makes me angry. And so I've been writing more and more. I've written more during the pandemic than in any time I ever have. What are you writing about, Ken? Well, I I'm writing about, I always do, I, I always take things like this and put them at a distance. It the pandemic to some extent has made me, I write co mostly comedies as you well know, uh, and uh, I virtually all, uh, even Jared Jack or Louise though, it's a romance as a comedy. And so I, I've get kind of dug down into my roots. I'm a big Jane Austen fan. So I finished three plays during the pandemic. One is Pride and Prejudice part two uh -huh. in, in Pemberley after Elizabeth and Darcy are married because it gets, it's great because it gets in, I get to live with these wildly comic and heartfelt warm characters for, you know, the time it takes me to write the play. And it's, that's a joy. And, and, um, and it, it's a celebration of family, uh, which is so important to me. So that's been one. Another is, is um, I've written a, a play called um, Lend Me a Soprano. <laughs> <laughs> Lend me a tenor for an all-female cast. Because one of the, as I get my dander up about these things, I mean, one of the things about theater universally, but uh, Shakespeare on, on, on up, is it's always been so male-centric. 
uh, the number of roles. And so uh, uh, this is an all female lend me a tenor. And another play I wrote is called Lady Molly of Scotland Yard which is a sort of um, uh, Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, detective thriller, but set uh, uh, also during World War II. I've become so interested in World War II, but based on a series of short stories written by Baroness Orsi, who wrote The Scarlet Pimpernel. And very few people know that she also wrote this little set of short stories about a detective and sidekick in imitation of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but they're women. And so I thought that would be fun to explore those, those characters. So I've been doing things. I always do that. I never write about sort of current event type plays. It's just not in me. I wish it was. I'm sure I'd be a better writer. I always write them at a, at a, at a distance. So I, uh, what's going on underneath touches me. Ken, what is it about your brain that draws you to detective uh, pieces or in a really funny way, comedy, because they're, they're quite mathematical in their own ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what it is about your own sensibility that takes you to those places because you're very skilled in those areas and you seem to be drawn to that type of material. Well, I think, you know, it's often called genre literature and uh, people who write it always get their back up. Gee, I'm not writing genre literature. I'm writing real literature. Look at, look at uh, Dorothy Sayers and, uh, you know, uh, Gaudy Knight. I'm just rereading now and it's a really wonderful novel. And, and Northrop Fry, the great critic, talks about how comedy and mystery are, are genres that are so much like each other and that for him, there's no boundaries to genre, genre in terms of genre literature, but they're, they're exercises where uh, this, this jigsaw puzzle has just been thrown up into the air and everything comes down and looks, you don't understand it, but it locks together in the end just right and we get a sense of reassurance. And that's true of comedy, it's true of all great comedies. Yep. The Marriage of Figaro, how yep. Beaumarchais just locks the pieces together. That's the beauty of comedy. So when I, I, I find such deep beauty in that line of, of that tradition of English comedy, and I say English because I don't know Spanish and Italian comedy. I don't speak the language as well enough. But in English language comedy from Shakespeare on, there is so much beauty and much ado and Midsummer Night's Dream and then into the, uh, uh, and into the 18th century with Goldsmith and Sheridan and on right on up to Wilde and, and, uh, and Shaw. And, and that's what I admire most. Yeah. It's great. Ken, we only have a few minutes left and I wanna make sure that we talk about um, what you're doing in terms of your new website, what kind of pieces that you're putting out to, your, to the public. Can you type that into the chat so that people can make sure that they go to it? I'm so slow, can I type it after we talk? Well, I'd be sure. able to, yeah, let yeah. me do that. <laughs> I'm such a slow typist. I write by longhand always. Uh, thanks for asking. I, I launched a new website. I'd had one for years and years. Moon Over Buffalo, by the way, my show on Broadway was the first show in history to ever have a website. Oh, I love it. Isn't that great? So I, I have my own website. Oh, uh, Rosie uh, already put it out there. www.kenludwigbuck.com. Oh. oh, thanks, Rosie. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, it, what I loved about developing, and it took like a year and a half, half thanks to Rosie, who works with me and, and a designer, what would it look like to tell the story of what my plays are like? And it was decided to do lots and lots of pictures because the photographs tell the stories because these plays are bright and colorful and comic and extravagant. So with the videos and the and all, all the things I've written about comedy, so it's chock full of those. So, so I've been... I, I, I'm very proud of it. Thanks. For I love that. that. I love that. I've got one more minute left, and this is a tough question, but I bet, I bet you can answer it. What was funny 15 years ago may not be funny today. And when <laughs> writing comedy, do you consider longevity of the comedy in your plays? Do you consider how that might be? Do you try and navigate it? Or if not, why not? I don't. I don't. I think it should be that. Look, I love Much Ado About Nothing just as much as they loved it when it was written in, you know, the 1590s. And I and uh, I don't. 
I write often my plays are set in the 1930s and 50s and anywhere that I think that story can be told. So I don't think so, I'm sure. But there are writers who clearly play into the current moment for their humor and I admire them. It, it's not what I do. Let me, let me you and I were, said we might talk about the fact that Arena Stage is helping me with this. I'm launching uh, 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 through my website and newsletter a, a, a book club, but it's gonna be a play club where everybody reads plays which is sort of a lost art. And we're gonna start with Dear Jack, Dear Louise, and then we'll have an hour session together with everybody who's read it online. So, so that's gonna talk about what it is to write a comedy. I love it, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Ken. We could, we could talk all night, but it's so great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. Molly. Take care, bye-bye. Jeannie Sakata, she's an actress, she's a playwright, she recent, recently enjoyed recurring and guest star roles on ABC, Shondaland's Station 19, Disney's Plus High School Musical, the series, and Disney's Big Hero 6. With her voice animation talent soon to be featured in two new projects for Marvel and Apple TV. On stage, she delighted New York audiences in 2019 as soulful and spunky mom in the Vineyard Theater's off-Broadway premiere of the brilliant new comedy, Do You Feel Anger? Uh, her celebrated solo play, Hold These Trues, won a ton of different awards. It was done all over the place. Uh, we had wonderful runs at Arena Stage. It was sold out at the Guthrie Theater, Pasadena Playhouse, Portland Center Stage, ACT Theater, Playmakers Rep. Welcome, Jeannie. Thank you. What an honor to be here. Well, it was such a joy to have you at Arena with Hold These Truths, and it's based on the true account of Gordon Hirabashi, a mm -hmm. Japanese-American who defied internment and eventually had his case taken all the way to the Supreme Court. And I love it because I bet a lot of our audience that are listening now came to see your production. Uh, can you share what drew you to the story, what the research process was like, and how you hope that the audience might absorb and react to the, your play now today? Well, uh, I was drawn very powerfully to this story because my father's side of the family, uh, they were in one of these prison camps in Poston, Arizona. And they grew up, my dad was just in high school when this happened. My aunts and uncles, you know, not much older. And they were really traumatized by it all because suddenly they, they had seen themselves as loyal Americans. Suddenly, overnight, seemingly, they were the enemy, you know, hated and feared, and, and, and they uh, had to go into these barbed wire prison camps and lived. My family was lucky, they were only there for a year, but many Japanese Americans were there for much longer. The actor George Takei's family was there for four years. And so I grew up with this. Um, uh, internalized pain in my household. Uh, when I asked my dad and aunts and uncles about these years, they would not talk about it. They would quickly change the subject. But you knew, you just absorbed the pain. You just kind of psychically intuited it. And, and I think that one reason I was so drawn to Gordon's story was because it was so redemptive for my own family's history and many others. You know, there weren't too many that were able to do what Gordon did to challenge the orders and resist. And um, Gordon was a very unique and special individual. He was at times so reminiscent of my father in his Nisei mannerisms and my uncles, but he would talk about these years in a way that I had never experienced before. He had many stories to tell. It was like a fountain of stories. And to hear him talk about how these orders were wrong and racist and how he did not know if he was going to succeed in his resistance, but he was going to resist. He was going to stand up for the America that he loved and that he believed in, even if it didn't exist yet. And I, I loved that he had that power and that vision as a young college student. Mm -hmm. It was extraordinary to me. Um, I researched it by interviewing Gordon extensively and 
reading a lot of different uh, resources, books and articles written by and about Gordon. Uh, I interviewed some people that knew him in those World War II years. Um, a dear friend of mine, Marilyn Tokuda, her mother, Tama Tokuda, was a friend of Gordon's at the time. They called him Gordy. And Tama told me, she said, Gordy shocked us when he resisted. We had no idea that our friend Gordy had it within him to do that. So I knew that this was a story that, you know, it, it was so riveting and it took all of his friends in his community and even his own mother by surprise that he would do this, which I thought was amazing. And it, it was a story that I, I thought was a real, you know, you wanted to just turn the page right away and see what happens to this guy. Uh, he also had such a winning personality. He confronted racism in what I think are very creative ways. You know, he um, found his way around situations that I would just feel rage over with a kind of generosity of spirit and making the moment a teachable moment. Even if he didn't win the moment, he sought to educate the other person that was discriminating against him as much as he could. Uh, so he would lead, try to leave them with something. Um, now, I think your last part of your question, Molly, was what do I hope people will take away from this? Uh, as you were talking about with Ken, we are in a very, very difficult time for our country. Uh, we've had you know, a national pandemic. Um, we've had uh, the previous White House, which you know, was so toxic and so uh, discriminatory toward ethnic groups and people of color and minority groups. And you know, now, you know, our Asian American community has um, you know, this resurrection of hate and hostility. And once again, as in Gordon Hirabayashi's time, we're being blamed for a national tragedy. So we're going through tremendous difficulties right now. And I think what I hope people will take away from Gordon's story, a few things. One is that one voice matters. Yeah. You know, one voice matters. And when Gordon resisted, he had to wait 40 years to be vindicated, but he never gave up hope. He always stood for what he stood for in those World War II years. And um, I also think that it's important uh, that we look at that fact that he didn't obtain that justice for 40 years and that he actually didn't expect to see it in his lifetime. Sometimes he told me that what we can do now, even if we don't see the fruits of our labor is plant seeds. You know, it's really our responsibility for the future generation to take these stands like Gordon did. If we, if we don't immediately win, even if it takes decades to get that justice, that's what it's going to take millions of step by step by step uh, movements uh, to make justice happen. And uh, so I hope that people will take away from the story also a sense of redemption and a sense of hope and a sense of responsibility. I think the play is going to be seen in a much different way than it was even when it was done at Arena three years ago. Yes. Um, because of what's happening right now and today, the Senate has passed the law in terms of anti-hate against Asian Americans. Yes. And it was passed bipartisan. Only uh, one person uh, voted against it. So a great moment uh, within, uh, within this particular fight. Yes. A great moment two days ago uh, with, the, with the conviction in Minneapolis. And um, I'm so interested in what groups are doing, how they are coalescing around the United States, really to speak up and speak out and take action. And yeah. I'd love for you to talk about I Holla Back, an organization providing free online bystander intervention training sessions for those who happen to witness someone being harassed or assaulted in this time when Asian Americans have been under attack. Um, the five Ds, distract, delegate, document, direct, and delay. I think it's perfect. It can make the difference between saving a life or providing crucial evidence in a trial. I mean, we look at George Floyd's murder. If it hadn't been documented, this would be a very different week. Absolutely. And uh, there was a really horrific video. I'm sure you saw it and many people listening today saw it 
of an Asian American woman, a Filipina immigrant woman being attacked in New York, um, you know, kicked in the face. And um, her daughter actually uh, uh, started a GoFundMe to help raise money for her mother's medical treatment. And she said, what you didn't see on that video, because of course it ended at a certain point, was that someone across the street shouted at the assailant and distracted him. And so he, it, it's so important. These five Ds are so important because if you shout or break out into a song or just do anything to distract the assailant, it could save a life. And absolutely that a brave young woman that filmed the suffocation of George Floyd by the police officer, by Derek Chauvin, you know, she, in the trial, I felt for her so much. She, she was expressing her pain at not being able to do more. But what she did was so important because that evidence, that video was key in the trial. So I, I think it's just amazing. I holla back. I've been recommending their bystander intervention to everyone I know because you never know, you know, you could be the person that by just some small action can change the course of history or change the course of a trial or save a life. That's beautiful. I'm also really curious about a workshop uh, that you have mentioned before called <laughs> Commit to Creativity. Yes. <laughs> and that was organized by Krista Vernoff, who was a showrunner you've worked with. So tell us about the writing exercise that you found so um, amazing. Yeah, Christopher Enough is um, the showrunner of actually three shows now, Grey's Anatomy and Station 19 and a new show, Rebel, um, working with Erin Brockovich on that one. And um, she, uh, as a fundraiser for the Actors Fund, uh, created this wonderful online seminar with uh, three amazing women, Debbie Allen, Nia Vardalas, and Cheryl Strayed. And Cheryl, of course, is an amazing author. She uh, wrote the book on which the play Tiny Beautiful Things was based, uh, adapted by Nia Vardalas. And she had us all uh, do a 10 minute writing exercise. And she said, this is what I want you to write about. The sentence, this is your deepest truth and here is what I know. Go, <laughs> 10 minutes. And so everyone on the online seminar wrote, you know, we're talking to us, this is your deepest truth, Jeannie, and here is what I know. And it was amazing what came out in just 10 minutes. And uh, some women um, shared what they had written, some men shared what they had written. And it was just such an amazing a time of recognizing the power that we have within us, the, the strength of the voice that we have within us, but that we often don't feel confident about. But this exercise really, you know, you weren't supposed to stop. You were just supposed to write and write and write. And when you don't stop yourself, it's amazing what comes out of your soul. So I wanted to share that because I think it's something that we all need to do right now. We all need to know what our power is. I think you're absolutely right. I think that's that's really beautiful. Well, you showed your power when you wrote Hold These Truths. So what are you writing next? I am actually right now working on a screenplay of Hold These Truths. And um, I, like I was saying, it is really interesting and wonderful uh, at this stage in my life to feel like I did when I was writing Hold These Truths. I had never written a play. <laughs> And I didn't know if I could do it, but everyone encouraged me, um, especially, you know, Che Yu, my mentor, who gave me the commission to work on it. And um, I, I remember feeling that I was on a great adventure. I didn't know what the next day would bring. I didn't know what the next hour writing would bring. But it was thrilling and terrifying and exhilarating. And I feel that way right now. <laughs> attempting to write a screenplay and telling this story in a different way, in a visual way, since film is a visual medium. Uh, so it's really charged my brain having this new challenge. And um, we know both, of course, we know Kenneth Lynn, you know, we were in the same uh, season together uh, at, a, at Arena Stage. And uh, I, I called Ken up and I said, Ken, I don't know if I should do this. And he said, I have faith that you can write a screenplay. 
And uh, so he gave, he said, the best uh, friend you could have right now is a deadline. So we made an agreement <laughs> that in a month, I can call him up again and say, this is what I've got. <laughs> oh boy, he's so right too. You know, yeah. I think as artists, we always have to have somebody in our corner that says, you can do this. Yes. When we have that yeah. moment of challenge, that internal challenge, can I do this? Can I make it happen? And for somebody to say, just go to song, right? Yes, yeah. you can do it. You, you got to do it. You got to make it happen and then push us off the cliff. What, what I really discovered, Molly, is that my um, feelings, my emotions had nothing to do with the quality of writing that I would be producing on every given day. Yep. Uh, you know, there were days that I just felt I should just go jump off a cliff. Why the hell did I ever think I could write a play? <laughs> you know? And I get so depressed, but made that commitment to write for at least two hours every day. So even if I wrote, this is terrible. Why did ever I think I could write a play? Even though that's all I wrote, I made the commitment to write. And um, what I discovered was once you write that, you know, for maybe 15, 20 minutes, it's gone. And then all the stuff in your subconscious comes up that you didn't know was there. And so on days when I would feel really depressed and in despair, you know, I would sometimes come up with some amazing ideas after I got that self-doubt out by writing it down. And then similarly, there are days that I thought, oh my God, this is genius. <laughs> and I felt overly confident and I would write and I would end up not using anything I wrote that day. And so I learned that the most important thing about writing is commitment to doing it. It's so simple. I don't know why it's so hard to face that blank page, um, but you just have to dive in. Mm. Well, Jeannie, I don't think any of us can wait uh, to see Hold These Truths as a screenplay. And I'm so happy that you're gonna be the one that's doing it. Thank you. So thanks so much for coming on. And uh, congratulations on all your amazing work. Oh, thank you so much, Molly. We'll never forget our time in Arena Stage. That was a highlight in the many years we've been doing the play. So thank you. Thanks so much, Jeannie. You take care. Bye-bye. Well, two wonderful writers. Uh, that was really fun. Um, my guest next week will be Sherry Edelin, uh, who's a terrific actor, teacher, and featured artist on the Artist Marketplace who arena stage audiences will remember from Dave, as well as the 51st State, our film, and Carl Cofield, who's the Associate Artistic Director of the Classical Theater of Harlem, director, actor, that arena audiences will remember from cutting up the piano lesson, other appearances. And uh, it also, uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about a great new role that he's just uh, taken on uh, that has has to do with an amazing moment in Carl's career. So I can't wait to talk to him about it. That gives you a little taste of it. And tonight's gift of art features highlights from Arena Riffs, three very different pieces from special artists. And this exciting commissioning project demonstrates our mission to showcase all that is passionate, exuberant, entertaining, deep and dangerous in the American spirit. Please enjoy just these little tastes of the riffs. My joy is heavy, the freewheeling insurgents and a more perfect union, enjoy. with dark stages immigrant babies in cages folks unemployed with no wages and if your skin is black it's still a fact you might get shot in the back and that's a our pill to swallow like a platinum aphrodisiac we are made in god's image so they try to pillage the treasures that reside inside our souls bodies and minds but our values intertwine with the fate of humankind so wheel off and rewind and be creative with your time 